Kenya is located on the east coast of the African continent. It's got an equatorial climate that makes it ideal for the cultivation of coffee, tea, and tourism. And it boasts idyllic landscapes and over 40 national parks and reserves full of lush wildlife. It's home to over 100 species of mammals, including impalas, rhinos, giraffes, lions, and of course, elephants. But this isn't your average wildlife documentary. I'm Earl, and that's Craig, my best friend. We both wear glasses, and he's the one with the red shoes. And we call ourselves philanthropologists because we spent our lives studying the messy business of helping people. And now we're traveling the world looking for do-gooders and change makers. And that's why we're here in Kenya to tell the story of a local tech company trying to make a difference in the land they love. A tech company determined to support the stewards of this wildlife and aid them in their fight against poachers and progress. It's a partnership to make sure that even at the edge of civilization, this guy can get a signal. It's 4.30 a.m. in Nairobi, Kenya, the heart of the Silicon Savannah, a tech hub you probably didn't know existed. We're embarking on a journey to a remote region of the Chulu Hills, a national park in the shadow of Kilimanjaro. Our mission? To bring the internet to a nonprofit protecting wildlife from poachers and other threats across millions of acres. few hours outside of Nairobi, and we cut from the main road, and just like that, civilization falls away, and we're in open country, the middle of nowhere. This is a Brick expedition. Brick is a for-profit company of engineers, programmers, and technologists. Their goal is to take the internet to the ends of the earth, to anywhere that a big internet service provider can't go or won't go. Their offices may be in Nairobi, but several times a year, they put together a small team for outreach and exploration. They're like a band of misfits from some lost adventure series, each bringing their own special skills to the table. They field test their equipment, meet the people they help, and try to have a good time doing it. This year, we were lucky enough to tag along. stop is a stop for chai. Real tea. Kenya, man. Chai. It's near religion. The Maasai people living in the Boma nearby have turned up to say hello. One of the many tribes they're notable for having adhered to their traditional nomadic lifestyle. No small feat in a rapidly modernizing Kenya. So this little Boma here is like, you know, Maasai, and mm. all of the livestock in the middle is their value, like that's that's their money right there. Right. So they protect the so you livestock. you got an inner circle, an outer yeah. circle. Yeah. And the, the shrubs around the thicket is to keep lion and other animals out. It's hard to tell which ones are, so sheep tail down. Yeah, sheep, sheep tail up. down, goats tail up. And here's all the Maasai. Yeah. Sava. They bring exquisite handmade jewelry and cultural artifacts to Our destination near Amboseli National Park is only a couple hundred kilometers from Nairobi, but this isn't exactly the Audubon. It's a cocktail of dirt, sand, rocks, and culture that on any other trip would be an adventure unto itself.
Another few hours of dirt and we arrive at the Big Life Foundation headquarters. It's one of the largest anti-poaching organizations in Kenya, and their far-flung ranger posts are the definition of off the grid. Rick is going to bring internet connectivity to these outposts deep in the Kenyan bush to improve ranger quality of life and to minimize the need for boots on the ground in this unforgivable terrain. This is their head of security, Craig Miller. He's a Kenyan native who's spent his life fighting poachers, flying planes, and drinking chai. Grab me one as well, if you would. Not the flowery cup, <laughs> maybe just a regular white one so I look masculine. This is going to be seen by people. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't realize that you went with the butterflies. Yeah. <laughs> What's the dog's name? Droga. 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 So the role of Big Life in these areas is to do what? So under my department, which is the security, is, is to provide wildlife security and, and prevent poaching from happening and mitigate human wildlife conflict. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the whole ethos behind Big Life is to drive meaningful benefits for the local people through wildlife. Mm. You know, if wildlife's going to have a, a future here, then obviously it has to mean economic returns mm -hmm. in the long run. So what animals are you guys protecting? Pretty much everything within there. Mm -hmm. You obviously pay more attention to what we call high value species, which are elephant, lion, leopard, etc. stuff where they're trophies essentially that, that are then entered into the legal wildlife trade. Um, in Kenya it's illegal to kill any of those. So Even the traditional early. tribes like the Maasai and people like that are still prevented or yeah. prohibited from yeah. killing to eat? Yeah, it depends on, again on the certain, certain situation. You, you get guys who come in from Tanzania, you know, fully armed, try and get as many elephants as they can. You know, we've had a case where six elephants were shot on one thing. Wow. Yeah. Mm. But then you get a farmer who, his farm's been squashed by elephant, and he throws a spear to scare them, and the elephant dies. You wouldn't charge him under poaching. So, I mean, it's a messy business. It's yeah. a messy business, but why do you do it? Um, well, I mean, I, I've always loved wildlife. Mm. You know, growing up, um, first, first job I wanted to be was a game ranger, but right. very different to what I thought a game ranger was, obviously, in those, in those early days. So part of what you do is you're surveying in a plane, you know, this one and a half million acres. You've got all the disparate ranger stations that are out there, but you know, how does technology play in? So many ways, and obviously looking to kind of increase that. But, I mean, the biggest thing rec in recent times has been our digital radio network, you know, where now you can live track rangers where they're going, analyze their patrol routes, locate them when there's something going on, and, and organize a response. But in terms of long-term plans you know, it'd be amazing to have every elephant microchip and track and that's coming i've got one elephant that i can follow on my iphone oh and no I, really well can anyone in the world can we like put up no, a, no, no, no. He's, he's, he's a you don't want huge to. elephant we all of a sudden i realize how bad an idea <laughs> yeah, that was as soon as i said yeah. that. <laughs> big life foundation is protecting almost two million acres with limited personnel and outdated technology they often rely on aerial surveillance due to the extreme remoteness and the difficulty of the terrain From the air, it looks a lot simpler. Farmlands and wildlife side by side. On the ground, though, it's a different story. This landscape is a huge natural resource that the local people rely on for their livelihoods. Their farms keep growing, but with every acre they add, they encroach upon the nationally protected land. Back on the ground, Craig shows us a major wildlife corridor and the electrified fences that they use to keep the animals off the surrounding farms. Over a thousand elephants use this crossing every three months as they move from one part of the Amboseli Park to another in search of food, water, and love. Which brings us to Tim. Tim is one of the world's biggest elephant, certainly in the top five in terms of tusk size. In you, the world? In the world. Your tusks never stop growing. A tusk like one of his would go for a couple hundred thousand dollars in China. So he needs a lot of protection. But unfortunately, he's also a cereal crop raider. There's no elephant on earth who'll walk through a ripe tomato field and, and not eat any. So you can understand when someone is 100% reliant on his farm to get his kids through school, feed his kids, feed his family, and he loses all that income in one night, he's gonna be understandably very angry. Over the past four years, we've treated him three different times for, for injuries. Um, what were the injuries? Injuries are from spear wounds. He goes into farms and someone chases him out. 
Um, and while they're chasing him out, they throw a spear and, and they've all been minor, fortunately, but obviously something to, to be very worried about. So tell me what it's like for a uh, top elephant in the world. What kind of privileges does Tim have among the other elephants? The older you are, the more the closer you get to your peak breeding capabilities. Right. So the bigger you are, the more dominant you are. And they'll come into a thing called must, which is just a high, higher testosterone level. And try and time it at the same time as all the females come into estrus. How many do you think you'll do in that three month span? <sighs> a couple of hundred. He gets all the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you can get out and try and get closer if you want. These are not the kind of elephants who are used to people. They're not like the ones you see in parks and zoos that encounter a thousand tourists a day. They're like any wild animal, and they can be extremely dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. Luckily, we got Craig with us. Don't run, even if he's coming. So if you, if you start running, then he can see you all of a sudden. But if you're frozen and you make noise, He's not sure what's going on. So he can't we're see in real trouble. Can I tell Earl to go running <laughs> and then I'll stay put? Slowest one gets squashed. <laughs> that was just a little warning. Doesn't want us getting too close. That, that was enough for me. <laughs> After Tim showed us why he gets all the ladies, we're ready to get back to the relative safety of the technology component of this story. I played it cool, though. I'm going to the office. <laughs> <laughs> Our experience notwithstanding, you can see why millions flock to Kenya to experience these magnificent wild animals on safari. And yet elephants here are caught between the expansion of local community on the one hand and the need for preservation and tourism on the other. Throw in the growing demand for the illegal ivory trade, and it gets even more complicated. The Brick team was anxious to scout the Makururo Ranger Camp. It's where they're prototyping their Moja network, and it's another three hours into the countryside. We crossed into the Chulu Hills late afternoon. It's a bizarre but beautiful landscape from an alien world. But with rain on the way and a setting sun, it's also the bane of four-wheeled and two-wheeled vehicles alike. Right, Traveling in the rain is bad enough, but in this terrain laden with computers and cameras, it can be catastrophic. Low, dry areas like this are susceptible to flash flooding, which makes the thoroughfares and the roads impassable. The rain came and the sun set, but we made it. The Chulu Hills, a volcanic range of hills lying in the shadow of Kilimanjaro that divides the Amboseli and the Savo Plains. All three are national parks protected by the Kenyan government on paper and organizations like the Big Life Foundation on the ground. We're right in the middle of the Makururo Ranger Base. It's the Big Life outpost charged with protecting the black rhino population in the area. Working alongside the Kenyan Wildlife Service, their goal is to protect these rhinos long enough for them to repopulate. Living in the middle of nowhere for months at a time can be tough and just plain boring. It's one reason the Brick team is here, to install their Super Brick router, which is the culmination of their design efforts. This is hardware created with this type of environment in mind. It will provide the camp with a free Wi-Fi network, which will improve the quality of life for the Rangers and support the work they do. What were the problems that they were running into that, you know, the, a more high-speed, reliable internet provides them? Well, so one was cost. You know, we're quite remote in the bush right now. Right, yeah. Um, we're doing about 30 kilometers on this point-to-point -point link. Right. Um, and to try and get dedicated capacity on that link mm -hmm. would be quite would be too expensive for this camp to run. Gotcha. And all the peripheral uh, services, mm -hmm. all these things that make the internet run, mm -hmm. we're running on here as well, like a mini data center. And this just keeps everything more reliable, a little bit smoother. Okay. So rather than just, you know, a lockdown Wi-Fi for the rangers here, we've now got um, internet for the whole community um, right. running Mojo Wi-Fi. Mojo is a free public Wi-Fi service mm. that allows content creators uh, and tech companies to distribute their content on the device, um, and, that's, and that's how we end up, we can pay for the link as well. Their Mojo network is key. They're able to subsidize the expense of the internet and give access and connectivity to a place that isn't feasible with traditional models. 
In addition to keeping the rangers in touch with their families and giving them access to entertainment, it allows them to send photos and maps back to headquarters in real time. This can make a critical difference in saving an injured animal's life. And as we soon learn from Joseph, it's more dire than we could have imagined. But really only seven. Only seven. Seven species? I mean no, seven. Seven actual seven animals. Seven individuals. Wow. That's it. So that, how many, how many males and how many females? Two, two, uh, two, two bulls. Yeah. And do you have, have you had baby? Rattles? Yeah, we expect to another baby uh, in uh, last time. Oh, really? Yeah. And yes. they're poaching mainly for the horn. Is the horn yeah. the only thing they take? The only at the horn. Just the horn. They don't use so they kill the, that big majestic animal just for the horn. Just a small piece. Like, uh, it's, it's like a big alley. They yeah. just wanna, they want only the tusk. Joseph agrees to take us out on patrol with the rangers. They're gonna take us to the rhino watering hole and to check the camera traps, which is the main way they're able to document and keep track of these animals. What's the hardest thing about being a ranger and having to do this work? Uh, my challenge, yeah, um, maybe uh, the terrain. As you have seen here, we have much, uh, a lot of stones. Okay. Yeah. They, they change positions. Mm -hmm. So getting them, it's, guys, that's it, a challenge. Mm -hmm. Going to where they are and identifying them. Sit down and say, do you understand? This is life and death. Yeah, we have, first you have, be, you, have, you have to be trained. Right. Yeah, for nine months. But even before training, you have to have, you know, passion. have the passion of doing that job. Start it. Right. Did, how long have you been a ranger? This is my 10th year. 10th year in, how about you? 20th year. 20th year, wow. Yeah. No, you, does your family understand that you're fighting for animals? And is that okay with them? Yeah, they know. They know it's a good job. Yeah. The only way to retrieve the camera data is to come out to the bush and physically check the memory card, which is both time and resource intensive. And then the information is days, even weeks old. Is this on now? Yeah. <laughs> While Earl was screwing around, Mark from Brick picked up on the issue immediately. When I see a situation like this, I'm thinking Pico Brick. You're thinking what? I'm thinking Pico Brick. Our sensor technology. They're built hardy, yeah. so they stay outside. Yeah. And um, they can send these right. to, to, to the base camp. So instead of them having to come to each of these cameras through the brick, yeah. you could actually send yeah. the, send send the signal back. Yeah, we could oh, do wow. it in real time. So you wouldn't have to walk yeah. out here. Yeah. But also could, you could get here more quickly if you could see kind exactly. of live time. Exactly. Yeah. The sensor can have multiple functions. Uh -huh. One of the functions could be to even check the battery level. Wow. So it can even tell you perfect, that area needs uh, a change of, yeah, A1 or B1, stuff like that. So we could do that too. What's the plan for next like, week, maybe? Like, uh, <laughs> we really need it. <laughs> Joseph wants you here next week. <laughs> yes. Today we start with Wi-Fi, and then we, we talk about the other stuff. These guys really believe in what they do. In talking to Joseph, you can tell he's proud of the team he commands. They all come from local tribes, and they're working hard to educate and inspire a new generation that understands the importance of the work they do. When we got back to camp, we got to see just how tedious checking camera traps can be. If going onto the field is resource intensive, at least then it's an adventure. Whereas this is straight data processing, and with only seven rhino, even photos are rare. That was as close as we got to seeing one. The future of their work depends on technology, and thanks to the new digital radio network, a communication came across about an active arrest in the vicinity. So we got a, a report from a, an informant. Um, this guy had killed a dick dick last night. A dick dick is a small deer. Um, and he was still drunk this morning, drinking at a Chang'a den. Chang'a is the illegal brew. Right. So this is called a kadu, and it's it a bright torch. You can see how many batteries they've attached to it. Mm. 
So that at night, obviously, they shine it in, in their eyes and they freeze. <coughs> and then that, they use the, the light and the noise to stun the animal. And then they'll, they'll get cut it cut with that. So is he just doing this for food, or? He would have shared it with some other workers on the farm. Hmm. So he'll go to court now, and then we'll take a sample of that, get sent to the lab, get an official report to confirm what species it is. He'll get two, three years minimum. Two, three years. And that's it. He killed a small deer simply so he and his friends could eat, and they have to throw the book at him. It doesn't seem as black and white as someone killing an endangered species for trophies or profit. This guy's worked in this ecosystem for about 30 years. Mm. How many times have you caught him? About around five, five to six times. Mm. Commercial bushmeat can get 10 years. Um, we wow. caught a guy with 270 kilos of giraffe meat in June. He was sentenced to 10 years in, in, in on Thursday. It's not a surprise to these guys that... He knows it was. But he's a habitual poacher. He's like Tim. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Some habits are hard to break. It's hard to watch this man go to jail for years just because he had to eat. Beyond the need to protect the animals for their own sake, tourism in and around the national parks help bolster the local economy. Big Life's goal is to create harmony between the local people and the wildlife. As Craig said, for wildlife to have a future here, it has to benefit the people. Craig Miller had to deal with the situation on the ground. So we headed out with Joseph to join up with the Brick team in an isolated part of the Chulu Hills. When we finally caught up with them, they were happy to introduce us to yet another important Kenyan tradition. Well, the only question I have is what are we doing here <laughs> in the middle of wildebeest with a sunset? Sundowners. Sundown is a very Kenyan tradition. When the sun's about to go down, right. break out whatever grog you have. <laughs> this happens back. every day, you know. The sun goes down <laughs> every single day. Which makes it a brilliant tradition. One of the greatest traditions. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. When you live and work in a place where you build things, mm -hmm. you build different things um, than people who live elsewhere. And the guys in Palo Alto are building some of the most amazing technology in the world. However, it doesn't work here. And, um, and so, while the problems they're trying to solve are interesting, uh, they're maybe not as big or as important as some of the problems we're trying to solve here, in this, at least to, in our world. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's really seeing uh, the challenges they're going, the human challenges they're going through, mm. and then looking at uh, what the objective is, right. and then solve some of, the, uh, some of the problems that they're facing. But it really takes us like several hours, several days to reach it to each and every camera drop. Right. So I think with this technology, it really help a lot. Also, he was telling me sometimes he'll come there once or uh, twice a week. Mm. If it's a week ago that the picture was taken, the poacher is long gone. Right. He, he also said he, he has to go all the way to the base camp to know if he even has any picture because he has to take the memory cut out. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so these are challenges that indeed technology can help with. Yeah. You know, in the West, the idea of innovation is, could I change my thermostat from my phone? You know, could I make my coffee pot, uh, notify everybody on Facebook what blend I drank this morning? Like, it's insignificant. <laughs> You're not fundamentally changing anybody's life. But here is life or death, you know? For those rhinos, yeah. if, we don't, if we don't capture that data more quickly, they're gonna die, and then they're gonna be gone. So the, the size and scale of the problem is much more significant. So it's lion-sized problems versus scratching at fleas. Awesome, yeah. Cheers to everyone for the whole expedition. Cheers. To uh, Brick, to the good work they do, to Big Life Foundation, and the great work that you guys do. I think we had a good time. Today.